Good afternoon, everybody. Now, you know what's interesting, by the way, is this room was full before. Um, and now here we have a panel on diversity and, and inclusion in an industry that is underrepresented by minorities and women in one of the most diverse communities in the country. So that is probably a preview of why we have a challenge in terms of creating greater diversity within our industry. Um, but before I begin, uh, I'd like to bring in um, our fellow uh, panelists. Um, first person I want to bring up for us is uh, Melissa Rose. She's a managing director in Ackman Ziff, one of the premier commercial real estate investment banking firms in the country. And she is one of the few women who is a leader in this industry. Peggy Olin, the CEO of One World Properties. Um, she is a transformer in her industry. She is one of the few women who lead an organization such as hers, and she's gonna be able to bring us some great insight. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> and then there is a broker extraordinaire uh, who is also a friend someone who I look to to give me some guidance in terms of where the markets are going. Um, one of the best uh, teams in the world when it comes to real estate marketing, branding, and sales, um, and that is John Gomes of Eklund Gomes' team at Douglas Elliman. So as you can see, we've got an interesting panel here today. And some of you all may have watched uh, the Democratic presidential debate the other night, this past uh, Tuesday night. And at the forefront of the discussion was income inequity, wealth disparity, and racial gender discrimination. And so that is one of the big topics of our nation's discussion now. And our industry is an industry that, one that is transformative, with low barriers to entry, that also is one of the most diverse industries in the country. But I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. There is not a single industry in the United States, industries where women lead the industry, such as being elementary school teachers, where men are not paid more for the same job than women. So part of that discussion, today's discussion is going to be about those very issues. But I wanna start at the macro level. So I'm putting up a slide now that shows that the average white household net worth is 10 times that of Hispanic or black household net worth. So let's put that up on the screen. And my question to the panel will be, what are the causes of this inequity? And does the real estate industry play a part? So uh, John, you want to take it? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm not sure what the, what the problem is or what creates the gap. I think that we can honestly say, because we all are looking at this room, and I think you alluded to this, you had a, a packed room uh, before uh, for the, the past three speakers that were here. And here we've got, I think, maybe about 25% of the people that are left. I think that's representative of what our country is like, quite frankly. And I think that that's what causes that gap. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the problem is, but I think in me, uh, having a team where I'm trying to uh, grow and expand the team, I'm learning that I have a social responsibility. And I have to admit that at the beginning of the process, I... Uh, I didn't realize that, and I wasn't hiring people and considering that I have a responsibility to actually change that outcome, to increase the ratio, to make it more fair, to be more inclusive. Uh, and it's something that I noted because, quite frankly, someone pointed out to me. Uh, and when it was pointed out to me, I made a conscious decision to start actually looking 
to bring in more talented people that were perhaps being overlooked uh, and an opportunity that I felt that I had with the platform that we have to increase the visibility so that other people would maybe follow suit. So I think part of the problem is that people are ignoring the problem and that's what's creating the inequity. So I think, so what you're saying is that we can all do more by taking affirmative steps uh, to do that. Correct. So Peggy? Well, I think we're, we are in uh, South Florida. Diversity, we are in a melting pot. And we are very fortunate to be able to embrace it the way we need to embrace it because the reality is we, my industry, our firm, we, are in the, we sell real estate. And who do we sell to? We sell to a diverse group of people. So if we don't include diversity in our teams from all, from race, from color, from ethnicity, everything, it's what gives us power as a team to be able to do that. But I think a lot of that is, is the, the gap between what you're seeing in this chart between white and black, white and black families and Hispanic families. I mean, it really is, I, I think it's currently starting to change because of people like, like right now, like this panel, really speaking about it and really empowering our younger, our younger generations. Because today, when I look at my girls, it's a very different opportunity of when I was younger and the, and the things that are being said. Because the reality is that it comes from being able to speak and being able to be, really be vocal about what your beliefs are and not really being afraid of that, which is really, I think, what's really held back in our society. No matter what you are, whether you're a girl or a you know, minority in general, you got to be able to, to be able to speak up. And I think those, these types of initiatives are really helping today. That's great. I'm Melissa. I, I, I think it's pretty remarkable that this is the first real estate event I've ever attended that even addressed diversity. So, I mean, that in of itself is, you know, the room may not be packed, but I'm glad that, you know, the real deal valued this is something that we need to be talking about. Um, you know, I, I think a lot has to start from the top up. So something that I'm starting to see on the capital advisory side is, you know, large institutional clients that are saying, you know, if you're going to pitch for a piece of business, we want to see that you're bringing a diverse team to the pitch, that you have women in leadership, that you have minorities that work for you. So I think we're starting to see change and, and that's positive, but you know, we still have a long way to go. Um, I think aside from the responsibilities that John mentioned, education is a huge piece of this. So I think, you know, it, it's really important for us to support and mentor, you know, kids coming up, you know, and educate them about the businesses that we're in, why they're interested in, why we're interested in it, why we're successful in it. And, you know, that sort of trickles down to people becoming, there being more applicants that companies can actually hire in these roles. Yeah, I think you make a good point. Also, I think the fact that what Peggy pointed out is that we are in Miami. Miami's one of the most diverse communities in the United States. Um, and so it has embraced diversity in a cultural mix um, as it's evolved into the world-class city that it is today. What's interesting, though, is when I first came to Miami, I came here in 1995 on vacation and ended up having the rights to develop the Royal Palm Hotel in South Beach. But I, hap I happened to be reading a newspaper about a story about um, a hotel that the city wanted to develop. But what was more interesting is not the development opportunity, but the reason that that hotel opportunity was created because there was a tourism boycott by African-Americans um, during the 1990s, um, boycotting Miami-Dade because of, of how they treated Nelson Mandela when he was freed from uh, prison. And how Miami, and that boycott was led by the NAACP, but by, by 2000, the NAACP was holding its national conference in Miami Beach because Miami Beach saw the challenge, Miami as a city and a, and a community saw the challenge and became more inclusive and took affirmative steps like John um, suggested to do that. So if we go now to thinking about, um, you know, one of the other aspects about being entrepreneurs um, and having access to capital. So to give everybody a sense, there is $69 trillion, um, and let's put up slide two. There's $69 trillion being managed by funds uh, in the United States. See, out of that $69 trillion, 1.3% is managed by funds owned or operated by women or minorities collectively. So does the fact that women and minorities have 
far less access to capital. Is that um, a, a cause of the problem? Do you think that has some impact on the experiences that we are seeing around the country where minorities and women are underrepresented and underpaid? Uh, naturally, there's definitely, of course, I mean, if you don't have access to the money and the rest of the, I don't know, I, we do the math here, it's 68 trillion dollars is being given to non-minority or uh, then of course you don't have as much opportunity you need money to be able to do things and I just will never understand because they are it's it's not because minorities are not intelligent it's not because minorities are not creative it's not because minorities are not hard-working so for me I always think what a missed opportunity this country has to do really great things because if we could really make that connection and start finding a way to funnel that money into the hands of those individuals then we could do really amazing thing. So there's just a tremendous missed opportunity. But yes, obviously, because they don't have the funds to do it. Yeah. So, so um, you were getting ready to say something. So, so we had talked about this earlier. You know, I, I think aside from access to capital, you know, with the absence of minorities and women in leadership positions in a lot of organizations, it also sort of, it, it, it supports the disparity between incomes between both women and minorities. So we have a lack of presence in a leadership position, which I think trickles down to, to the disparity in income between you know, these groups as well. But I'm sorry, you started by mentioning the word entrepreneurship. Yes. Which is really an important piece here. Because I think what happens is, I can speak for myself, 2008, the real estate market was where we know where it was, where we wish we all had more money to buy everything up, right, today in retrospect. But when you're really thinking back and the opportunities that were there at the time, nobody was gonna come to me and say, I'm gonna give you X amount of dollars so you can go open a firm or go do your thing. I needed to really come out and prove myself to do it and do the job. So a lot of times, especially for minority, it's like sometimes you gotta prove yourself. You work harder, you have to be show and show your power by really executing. And once you start executing, doors start opening up. So I think the difference is too that even though some of that capital may not be readily available right, right now and right there, it really gives you the time. And so when you have the time and you invest the time in yourself to really prove to what you believe in, you can get done. Then the doors open up. And I think that's what we're seeing a lot more now that people are not afraid to really step forward and do it. I also, I also want to add, when I was in business school, it was very diverse. And you know, schools really get this right. Uh, they understand the value of bringing diversity together in the classroom because we all have so much to learn from one another's different perspectives. I then graduated from business school and I worked in the real world and business that I'm in. And the irony is, is that I walk into boardrooms on a daily basis and you know, I am the minority. You know, And it's, I look around and there's, there's no other leaders really that I see on a regular basis that are of color. And it's just, it's astonishing to me. There is that disconnect. And obviously this chart represents that. So the schools are giving people the opportunity because it makes sense for the learning. Uh, and then you get out and you don't have the money to do things. So that's, that is the disconnect. It's frustrating. I think the income disparity, though, it relates to entrepreneurship to me because I, I think part of starting your own business is, is having a great sense of confidence and learning how to negotiate on your own behalf. So I, I think part of this is, you know, as, as you start, start taking steps towards becoming an entrepreneur, if you're in a role where you're being confident compensated by a company, you need to learn how to advocate for yourself, even though you may not be compensated in the same way that your male counterpart or your non-minority counterpart is. Yeah, I think, look, I think that there, in Miami, I see, I, you know, I've lived in Washington, D.C., New York, uh, Miami, in my adult business career, and I do business in about eight different states around the country. So I see Miami is extremely unique. I mean, Miami is very diverse. Um, it's diverse across the board. You, if you want to look at the power of diversity, go downtown in Miami, go to Brickell, go to Miami Beach, go to South Beach. You will see that those buildings are all developed by a diverse group of people. And as a result of that, I think let's talk about the brokerage business, for example. Um, uh, there is an opportunity where the developer makes a decision on who is going to sell their properties, who's going to provide the financing who's gonna provide all the professional services. And if the developer approaches things like John mentioned and says, okay, I have a responsibility to dig deeper to find super talented diversity, but super talented women to do things, super talented minorities to do things and, and their firms to do things in our projects, then that creates greater diversity. And that's what we saw in Florida. But if you go to New York City um, and you go to Manhattan, for example, and you draw a line at 110th Street, which is Central Park North, and you go all the way down 
there is one building of any consequence that's been developed recently by an African-American, and that's me. And that's not because I'm super talented, because this is an uncomplicated business, and I'm an uncomplicated person, although my wife may differ with that, but I'm an uncomplicated person, and so I'm not super smart, so to be, for me to be do, able to do that, it was having access to capital. So how do you explain that at the top levels of our industry, that there is very little diversity. I mean, anybody want to take that on? I mean, well, the way I see it in our side, I mean, when you're looking at selling and developing, um, selling and marketing and sales for developments, for residential developments in general, we at the top, there are not that many women that are leading their own firms um, here in South Florida. There's some amazing women in New York. I see more of that. I don't see uh, I don't see such a big gap when it comes because we in our world we do have the advantage that you know we eat what we kill right we have and we have the ability to the the disparity in income it's not as bad anymore because we control it and you have to believe and you have to sell and you go out there and sell your product. Um, I don't see that uh, gap as much on the top on my side. But what I do see is that diversity on my side comes also again with pedigree. So for me, being a you know immigrant, you know from Miami, I'm from South America. How do you how do you battle coming into the world of being in the? You can't go into a New York brokerage and real estate and, and try to compete um, with those markets. But we do. But what what's amazing is that I never want to compete, but you want to be seen as an asset because you are bringing a different set of values. You're bringing a different perspective. And I think collectively and working together as a teamwork helps, helps everyone. And I think for me, that has been the greatest success um, that I've seen. So I actually, I feel similar to, to Peggy in that, you know, I started my career in New York and I think it was actually a, a friendlier environment for women in leadership roles. Um, on the capital advisory side of the business, I think that women are incredibly underrepresented. There's pro I have more counterparts in New York than I do here. But I, I think you touched on something really important and that you know, a lot, it's opportunistic as well. And that I think a lot of the business that I land is because I have clients that value that my perspective is different, that my relationship to capital is different, that you know, my experience on the principal side of the business is, is valuable to raising capital for them. So y you've got to target clients that understand how valuable diversity is. In, in any sale, I think if you can connect with the audience that you're trying to communicate with and touch them in a certain way, you're going to be more successful. And you're always going to be more successful doing that if you have a broader group in the room. Yeah, for me, I have to say, coming from New York and spending most of my time and career there, um, you do have wonderful um, examples of women who are in leadership roles from uh, you know, the heads of firms in real estate. What you don't have clearly are enough, you know, minorities and black people and Hispanic people that are in those leadership roles. And I think, unfortunately, it goes back, I'll say again, back to that slide. It just, it's because you don't have the capital that's being distributed to them. It's also the, a fact that I show a lot of people and I sell a lot of people real estate. And I've been doing that for a really long time. I sell mainly real estate to wealthy white people. And I think that that goes back to the lack of capital and the lack of opportunity that minorities have to actually purchase. And I hate to say this, but I think that it's true and there is a correlation, unfortunately. I think that because there are not enough people who are minorities who are buying, it doesn't create enough opportunities for minorities to be representing buyers. Unfortunately, it's the truth. I agree with you. I completely agree, and I think all of you all make some very good points. Let me give you an interesting statistic. New York City, we just talked about New York City. New York City is 67% minority. It is 53% female. And I'm going to give you another statistic. Its governmental workforce is 80% minority. It's over 60% female. So... How does a New York City pension system invest its money? Less than 5% of its asset managers are women or minorities. The city of New York contracts out about $20 billion a year in contracts. Less than 2% of those contracts go to minority and women-owned firms. So the question here is that this is, we're talking about clientele. It's 
minority and women's money. It's their city, but yet when it comes to having access to the money that come from that, it's a lot more difficult, obviously. And so do you, is that something that is a fair system? And also I'm interested in whether any of you all have ever experienced in your careers, you're building your career, you're all very successful, have you experienced a double standard or obstacles um, based on race, gender, sexual orientation, any of that? Have, I mean, you know, I mean, because we haven't gotten into that yet either. Um, so have, have you all, anybody experienced any discrimination in terms of access to capital or opportunity? I wouldn't say discrimination, but I think that uh, in my side, what I've experienced is, um, again, let's go back to 2010. Um, you know, the world is kind of, the real estate market is changing. There was a great giant someone in South Florida called um, um, Starwood Capital who partnered with some top names in the country and bought out the chorus portfolio in real estate. I was very fortunate to have been considered to be able to run the sales and marketing for the entire country for that consortium. When I went to my interview, I, I, I walked in and they were, of course, a room, you know, full of men. And, um, and I, I just talked about what I was passionate about, how I was going to get rid of this $5 billion of inventory across the United States. Um, when, I find, when, I, when I took the, the position, and I, 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 I was the only uh, woman executive in the team. And what was really interesting was that um, at some point I thought, well, they probably needed a woman, so I was lucky enough to get, to get the job. But the reality was that it was an incredible opportunity to be able to speak up and, and be, have my voice heard. Because at some point it comes up and you say, you, you will always get shadowed. Well, you know, I think we're gonna do it this way better. But unless you really step up and say, you know what, I don't think so. I think you put me in this position for this and I wanna try it. Not being, you know, being vocal was a very big piece. Actually, right before I was talking to, to Lisette and she, 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 she made a great comment, which I actually applied to this. She said to me, you know, interesting, Women sometimes that are empowered or you're really empowered or you love what you do, you're called aggressive. And you're really not aggressive. What you are is assertive. And that was a great comment that she made because it's true. I think that, you know, if you know exactly what you're doing and you got to prove it, of course, after the first or second meeting, by the third meeting, I wasn't being questioned anymore because I knew that my strategies, the things that we were working on works. But I think going back to your point, you're sitting in a room full of people that have incredible pedigrees, who have incredible success, and you're given the opportunity and not being shy to really shine and be outspoken about what you want to do in your life and how you want to see something. It's really important. Great. So what you're saying is in there is also an opportunity. So the idea that in some regards, while there are barriers to entry, there's opportunities um, because of diversity. And Correct. that's probably becoming more of an issue today and certainly been an issue in Miami because Miami took many affirmative steps to diversify, to bring Latinos into all aspects of the business community, to make an effort with um, other minorities, African-Americans as well. Um, so I know you were getting ready to yeah, jump so, in there. So I, I think that I'm glad you said that because I think with every obstacle, there's opportunity and it's important for us to note that. But I think, you know, I, I don't feel like I've ever been discriminated against. But I think one of the things that makes it really challenging is the lack of mentorship. You know, just like you said, because there's so little at the top. I mean, I'm fortunate to have women like Peggy and like Lisette that, that, are, that are mentors and that can help me. But I don't have any women that do exactly what I can do that I can you know, talk about what it feels like to walk into a room that's filled with men where I only have male counterparts pitching for the same business and you know, figuring out how to differentiate myself and, and how to make it incredibly clear that I'm the most competent person out of the group of people pitching for the business to do the work. And, and I think you know, mentorship and education is so important to all of our growth. And, and that's why it's really important as a community for us to, to give back in any way that we can to help give that to someone else. In New York, we have these co-ops, right? And uh, it's very, it's always been strange to me that there's a co-op rule in many of these co-ops that say no far. To me, a foreigner is obviously a minority, yet they have this general rule that foreigners are not accepted in this building. And quite frankly, I think it's illegal, or it should be illegal, that the co-op does not have to disclose, the co-op board does not have to disclose why they're gonna reject someone. They can just unanimously decide that 
for whatever reason, they're going to reject that person. As a result, many of the minority clients that I have worked with or the foreigners say, you know what? Stay away from those co-ops. Get me into a condo. That's blatant discrimination to me. And that's what I have from my experience. And I find it very frustrating. Yeah, you know, what's interesting is that the market has made them pay a price for that discrimination as well, because don't co-ops sell at about 30% less in condos for an equivalent building? Exactly. Right, so people don't want to um, confront or be exposed to discrimination. I mean, so my experience as a, as a developer, look, we're building $4 billion of projects around the country, so I'm not a sad story by any chance. So, but I think that what I've seen in my career is that it's not necessarily blatant discrimination because I don't think, I mean, that's so illegal and I don't think people are intentionally most often being discriminatory. I think that it's embedded in, cult, in our culture to a degree. What I see is a double standard. I see that, like you saying, that you really have to go and prove yourself, um, which everybody should, but everybody doesn't. Um, I think that, so what I experienced was more of a double standard, second guessing, third guessing, and each time after you've proven yourself, you've got to go and do it again and prove yourself again to prove that you belong, to prove that you are worthy as opposed to being able, to, I see people coast on their reputations for 30 years and, and have done nothing to really build upon it and make it better. Have you all experienced anything in terms of the double standard or having to constantly prove yourself? I think I've felt a lot of that. Um, and, and I welcome the challenge because I, I feel like I, I work for a diverse team that's great at what they do. But I think the other thing is, is there's a presumption about knowing less than you do, which is discrimination, right? So when you walk into a room and you're an expert in something, but someone's assuming that you know less than you do because of your gender or your race, I mean, that, that, that's discrimination. It's just not as blatant. Yeah, and I think it's much more subtle. Let's go to um, slide three. We can. Also in sales, you're just as good as your last sale. Yeah, and you're, you're more working good, for you're yourself. Just, you're you, just as good as the last thing you just sold. You're, right. It's always, you have to constantly be doing something. Yeah, the benefit you get, though, from sales, right, is you are creating your own business. You're branding yourself. All, you all, you, you two, the two of you have branded yourselves very effectively. You build a brand, and you're selling your performance and your relationships and your reputation and your knowledge base to your customer. You're going directly to the customer. And there's not as much of a gatekeeper between you and the customer. Would that, would that be the case? Sure. Yeah. So maybe that's one way that people who want to break into our industry uh, can do that. One way that I've experienced a double standard is that um, I have a business partner, Frederick Eklund, who many of you know, I'm sure. And we've been working together. Yeah, we've been working together for almost 15 years. Now, I know that he's on a television show and people are enamored by his personality and they want to meet him for all the you know, good reasons. But before he was on the television show, it was the case that we would go into listing pitches together and I often felt that cold shoulder. Uh, I used to, in the beginning of my career, feel guilty because I thought, wow, maybe I shouldn't have come. Maybe, you know, this person isn't like, you know, doesn't like me because I'm a minority. They often, I, I compete with Frederick because people are drawn to him. People want to talk to him. And I honestly do think that it's because of his white skin and his blonde hair and his blue eyes that I myself have to work a little bit harder in some situations. It's not in all situations, but I have definitely been in the room more than once where I felt, you know, that, energy that doesn't feel so welcoming. Uh, so that to me is my double standard experience. So how do you deal with that? I think people, who, I mean, it'd be helpful for people who experience that. How do you deal with that and use it as, you know, a way to empower yourself? I deal with it by giving them my intellect. I try to make myself as comfortable as I can. I try to prove that I am just as smart, if not smarter than Mr. Eklund. He might be better looking than me. Uh, but I, I just, with full confidence, just, and, and by the way, I'm supported by Frederick because in truth, him and I have had these discussions before because I have left feeling guilty saying, you know, I wonder if we're not going to get that one because, and he said, if we don't get it because we don't want it ever. So I'm lucky that I have a business partner that is aware that this does exist and he appreciates and celebrates me and the diversity within our group. And that's how I deal with it. Great. Well said. You know, for, for me, I think the best, the best way to deal with something like that is really to have an incredible team. I think teamwork, it's, an, it, it's the most important thing in our, in our industry. Um, I always tell them, my team that I don't really care what other people are doing in our industry. 
I, 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 we have our own way of doing things and I like putting blinders on and we just go on our race, kind of like race horses do. Because if you start comp stopping and looking around and seeing what so-and-so is doing, this one or so do you're never gonna, you have to compete with yourself constantly. And I think that constantly by reinforcing that, reinforcing teamwork and really building that bond, it's the most important thing it's been for me. Yeah, I think you really have to believe in yourself and work through that because I think I walk into situations and try and use it as an advantage that I'm differentiating myself, that I'm naturally going to stand out in a pitch just because I'm different. So if I have the requisite skill set and, and I'm you know astute at what I do, then at least I have something that will make me more memorable. Um, works a lot of the time, doesn't work a lot of the time, and we just keep moving and, and become hone our craft and get better at what we do. Yeah, I, I credit it. Um as being underestimated. I came here in Miami Beach on vacation in 1995, happened to pick up a newspaper article in the Miami Herald discussing a potential development opportunity for the Royal Palm Hotel. Um, and they were looking for, because of the boycott, they were looking for an African-American developer to lead it. I figured, okay, first of all, how many African-Americans are there in a the country that could do this? How many are reading the Miami Herald? So great opportunity. And then no one took me seriously. I was an outsider coming from Washington, D.C., et cetera. So by the time they figured it out, I bought the site next door and then won. So I like the idea of underestimating. I don't get the benefit of that anymore, but I used to like getting the benefit of being underestimated. There, so there's a slide you'll see right now. And this is a question for, I mean, that is always baffling to me, is that women make 25% across the board less than men for every position. With the biggest, um, uh, by the way, women consistently earn less, as I said um, before, less than men across all sectors. The biggest pay gap, 33.8%, um, happens to be in the brokerage industry. And the smallest gap, 16%, is in finance. How do you, so, I mean, does that say anything to you? Um, why is that happening? I mean. You know, a majority of realtors today, 63% are women, um, and yet they still don't occupy anywhere remotely the number of executive positions. It's actually less than 15% of those positions are held by women. What's happening if this is an industry that's fair and giving everybody an equal chance? Why is there this pay gap, and why is it there this, this big disparity at the top in terms of management? Well, I think, I think it's, we're starting to see a change on that. Again, you know, we can't stress enough the fact that we have to continue talking about it, discussing it, bringing it up in panels. Like kind of you said, this is the first real estate panel you've been that talks about diversity. We all do it. We see it. We don't talk about it enough. But I think also remember the, the concept is changing as, as, as double income families are coming into the workplace. As, as you know, today, we are starting to see more, more stay at home dads than we used to see in the past. That's important. You know, we deal with the fact that we have kids, that we have, you know, we have to take them to school. Why should that just be the one, what we have to deal with? I think today in today's society, the, the men are really stepping up to really see them because there is an opportunity. The opportunities are there for women to come out and say, you know what? I, 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 I want to I wanna be able to be at work. Why should you only be the one going to the cocktail parties in the evening, not me with my peers? But I think that the more opportunities that are going to come up now is the more we talk about it. But in my industry, in, in what we do, I don't see the, different, the, the big gap because everybody, you know, we're all in the brokerage business. We all get paid that same. Um, so it's just a matter of how much harder you work. It just maybe in this case, men have more time because women are more involved in other things and have uh, other things on their plate. Um, and that may be the difference, but not necessarily because you get paid less. Uh, personally, for me, I think it's a lot of the same. It's sort of the, the good old boys club mentality that we've been dealing with for a very long time in this country. And I have to say, Frederick and I, last year, our team grossed $1.5 billion in transactions. Thank you. We, we, at that time, and by the way, the reason why we were able to do $1.5 billion in transactions last year is because we got smart enough and realized that we needed to hire someone to help us run our business. Well, we very consciously chose a woman to lead us. That woman is Julia Spillman. 
You might have read about her last uh, month in New York on the cover of The Real Deal. They did this amazing article and a feature on her because Julia deserves the credit. She's the architect of the expansion of Eklund Gomes. She's a highly intelligent, highly motivated, hardworking, beautiful woman who we call our superwoman. And she is the woman who stands in between these two men. And that is a very, very, very big part of our most recent success. I did that, we did that, Frederick and I consciously, because we knew that we have a platform and we had this opportunity to share with people what this incredible woman could do because we knew what she could do because we watched her sell out a building so fast in the South Street Seaport, which was a neighborhood where no one ever thought you could sell ever anything for over 2,000 a square foot, and she had a waiting list of buyers. She's an incredibly talented woman who we respect a great deal, who I hope people will take note of, and I hope the people who are in the power to hire people, minorities, and or women will look at us and say, look at what they did. And more importantly, look at what she did. So, uh, yes, absolutely. I feel really passionate about this because I, I think that part of this disparity is about that, you know, we're first starting women to see women learning how to advocate for themselves and how to negotiate for higher pay. So that, that's something that's just starting now. And, and part of the reason why I think we're behind is because you don't accept an offer. You have to you know, be able to articulate the value you're adding and ask for more. And that isn't something that I think women historically have done and that's really changing now and something that I think that's gonna help women you know, move that gap in. Advocate yeah. for yourself, negotiate. Don't be afraid to ask for more, ever. But advocate for yourselves and advocate for each other, right? Absolutely. I mean, there's, I mean, we can make a difference. Everybody else here can make a difference as well by advocating for ourselves. By the way, I have a belief, and, and, and also, um, Peggy, I think you mentioned this was the first um, diversity conference. It's actually the second. Amir and The Real Deal did one in Los Angeles. And in that one, the audience thinned out um, as well. Now, in downtown Los Angeles, I'm building a project called Angels Landing that's costing us about a billion six with $3 billion in potential condo sales. My, the audience that left that meeting left were a lot of brokers. I mean, what people have to understand is that diversity, people in diversity do business. All of you all do business. You send mortgage business to people. You, you, you send referrals. You finance projects. You know, we sell condos and buy. So people have to look at us and look at diversity as a business. But there, as we have seen in the political discussion recently, that there's been a movement to socialism. I mean, if you look at Bernie Sanders and you look at Elizabeth Warren, they are certainly pressing the agenda to the left. I have the belief that if you have these kind of numbers of, and you have the income and wealth disparity between minorities and, um, and, and white Americans, if you have income and wealth disparity between uh, genders, that's not a sustainable model. So. That is a danger and a risk to our capitalistic democracy because Americans are saying they've had enough. It's not fair. They want to operate within a fair system. Do you all believe that there is a, uh, a threat to our business if we are not more aggressive when it comes to economic inclusion? Or you think that we're all safe? You can just raise your hand, safe? or not, I mean. It's, I don't think it's a matter of being safe or not. I think it's a matter of just constantly being proactive and constantly being aware of our industry. I think everybody in this room who's in this business, you know, all of us are reading, all of us know, all of us, all of us are informed of what's happening. And I think death comes when you become stale and when you're not cre constantly creating. So I think that, I, I don't see it like that. I see it that it's just people just continue to get information and feed themselves to really grow. Constant growth. Anybody else want to take it? I think the focus goes back to education. You know, we ultimately you're not going to get hired or be successful entrepreneurially if you don't have you know skills and you aren't the best at what you do. So, so the more that we're helping to get people there, the the larger talent pool we're going to have to recruit from to make diversity a reality. Yeah, you know, it's I mean, it's a very different. I mean, we have to think about diversity in a very different way. I mean, I grew up during the civil rights movement in this country. And so during the civil rights movement, the fight was for basic civil rights. 
the right to go to a restaurant, the right to send your kids to the same school, the right to ride a, the bus and wherever there's a vacant seat, the freedom to travel, the freedom to be able to just stay in a hotel, the freedom to be able to come into a place like this, um, the, free to, the freedom to marry whomever you fell in love with. Those, those basic civil rights, ultimately most Americans felt that, yeah, it's okay, I mean, why not? What difference does it make? We, are, we should let everybody have their freedom. But the question is, and, and Martin Luther King asked this question, what good did it benefit black Americans uh, to be able to go into a desegregated lunch counter if they couldn't afford to buy a hamburger to eat there? So when we come to sharing, and our democracy is capitalistic, when we come to sharing economic opportunities, I don't think race plays as much into that mix or gender. I mean, if we're competing for a project, I'm not gonna say, you know what, I'm a progressive guy, you guys take it. I'm gonna fight to win it and get it. So people are not gonna be willing to share their money. So therein lies where um, you, you know, we're, Peggy, we're saying how it's important that you are prepared. I think the one thing that we can all zero in on though is to be prepared in our business means having access to capital. That's why I say JP Morgan, the largest bank in the world, has what's called advancing black pathways. That's why Larry Fink, the chairman of BlackRock, said that corporations now need to do more to be inclusive. So what's, if, we, if we look at the future, what do you see as a future? What's the future of our industry? Where is it going? What do you tell young women or young minorities um, what uh, you know, what the opportunities are in, their, in this industry and how should they pursue them and how should they approach a career in our industry? Well, first of all, I'd like to say what I'd like to say to everyone in the room, quite frankly, because I hear when you say Martin Luther King and you know, we've been fighting for inclusion and for equality. I just wanna quote, and I hope that I don't misquote him, Eli Wiesel, he's one of, he's my hero, really. He accepted the Nobel Peace Prize in 1986, and he wrote what I think is one of the most fascinating speeches. And truly, if you've never read that speech, it'll take all of five minutes, I can highly recommend the Nobel Peace Prize speech by Eli Wiesel that he gave in 1986 when he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize. The gist of it was that it's the indifference in this world that is hurting us the most. It's the people who are seeing and hearing and experiencing things that they're not speaking up and speaking out about. It shouldn't be when you talk about Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King's whole thing was that everybody should you know, be equal and that we should all together fight for equality. What is happening often, I think, is that we are trying to help our fellow minority women or men to advance in the world by giving them advice. We actually need the help of every single solitary one of you in this room, white people, black people, Asian people, transgender people, gay people, straight people, all people. There's stuff happening out there and you know it, people, and you hear it and you see it and you experience it and you just don't wanna say something because you might feel uncomfortable. We need you to speak up. I urge you to speak up Please, I know you know it's happening, and I know that you know that this is how you can help us. You just, sometimes people think, oh, it's not me. I heard someone say something. You don't want to get involved. You don't want to be confrontational. That, honestly, in my opinion, my humble opinion, is the biggest problem that we have in our society. Because if people like yourselves would say something, then people like them wouldn't act the way they do. That is the problem, in my opinion. It's kind of like what John Kennedy used a similar phrase. He quoted Edmund Burke, who really paraphrased from someone else, which is the only thing necessary for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. So we can make it more current to today. The only thing necessary for evil to prevail is for good men and women to do nothing. So we, you're right. If someone's going to discriminate against someone on gender, they're certainly going to discriminate against me. Someone's going to uh, discriminate based on sexual orientation, they're going to discriminate against me or vice versa. So we're all in it together. And we don't get to pick when someone and when we get discriminated against or when our opportunities are, are blocked. So Peggy, you want to jump in on yeah, that? Yeah, definitely starts from the top. But I think I, I also want to point out, you know, the reality is that 
you know, I'm a woman, minority, came to the U.S., you know, without speaking any English, and I'm sitting here in a panel talking about diversity because actually I kind of made it to the 1%, right, of the United States. So that is something that we cannot forget, that we do live in a country that gives us the opportunity to do so. And really stepping out of the line and really speaking up your voice, I cannot say enough that never, what holds us back is our fear and the fear that we put on ourselves and the fears that we tell ourselves because nobody's telling you anything. You're telling that to yourself. The fact that we are sitting, that I'm sitting here, I look at my team, I look at our projects that we represent, I look at the offices we have in China. Talk about being minority. You know, when I'm in China, I feel like a minority there for sure. I mean, there is no way. We have offices in Shanghai and Beijing. And, and when, when I'm there and I'm looking around, I say, wow, you know, I, well, if I did it in the U.S., I'm, I'm sure we can get it done here. But we forget how little we are in this world. I think empowering our kids, um, our workplace starts from the top, never losing the opportunity to really embrace not only gender and, 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 sex, and race, also, you know, the women that work with us, you know, or men that have, you know, little kids, you know, more and more families are having, you know, same sex families that have adopted children. You know, the, how do we, how do we apply that into our workspace? You know, I, you know, as long as our work gets done, I love when people be able to share and being vulnerable. You know, I think when you're vulnerable with your team, when you're vulnerable with the people that surround you and really talk about what, what, why are you upset? You cannot always be great. Everything is not rainbows and unicorns in life. I think, but people don't talk about the fears. They don't talk. When I'm sitting down with someone and I said, you know, I really had a tough day. You did? Yes. Let me tell you why. And you kind of open up, you know, a whole new dynamic happens. And I think that in our business, when it comes to, to the divide that we have, really being vulnerable and really being a team player and not being afraid of stepping out of the line, it's really what's going to make a difference. Well said. So I, I, I heard, I saw this quote the other day and I loved it. It said, you know, you should team with people that are completely opposite from you. And, and I thought that was, that's such a, it's, it just speaks to how important diversity is. When I look at my team, we have completely different gifts and talents and, and things that we're strong at. And the reason why we work so well together is because of that. And it, it's, diversity is gonna help you in any way because you, you, you mimic yourself, you just become boring and obsolete. Um, I think for me though, in terms of the message to women and, and, and what I've done is, you know, I'm, I'm very involved in crew. I sit on the board in Miami and I think it's fantastic to have an organization whose mission statement is to advance women in a business that are really underrepresented. And those are the things that you can do to not only give back, but empower yourself. You know, I, I've been totally encouraged by the women in this network and, and hearing their stories. But I feel for me, there's tremendous obstacles being a minority, being a woman, but ultimately I think it's been part of my success. And I think part of being, you know, different has helped me win. And I've used it as something to fuel me. And, you know, just like you said, you're negotiating against yourself and you're your worst enemy. So if you use it as ammunition, it can be incredibly effective. And if you use it as a sales tool to just, you know, really show that hiring a diverse team is going to benefit the client. And it, it's you're selling something that's very true and genuine. Yeah, I would agree. I think I share all of your thoughts. I mean, I look at... Um, the obstacles that I've confronted is making me sharper, made me work harder, kept me on top of my game. At the same hand, as our country evolved, Washington, D.C., even Miami, and other places around the country that we, wanted, that we do business in, they were diverse communities. So they were very receptive to someone like me coming in who was going to commit to, which is what our company does, we committed uh, two decades ago to doing 25% of all of our business with minority and women-owned firms. And now we have a goal of 35% of the four plus billion dollars of our projects to be with minority and women-owned firms. So we practice that inclusiveness, but that actually is an asset and it's helped us beat out some of the biggest developers in the world when we compete in the public-private space. So I think what our audience can be left with is one thing is that while there are challenges, the challenges make you better they make you stronger, they make you more determined, and they can present opportunities if you put yourself in the right place to take advantage of those opportunities. And that you operate from a perspective that you don't expect anything to be given to you, you don't expect it to be fair, and so you work harder to, uh, to overcome 
the, any kinds of obstacles. I mean, I think as we go forward in our society, um, we are going to see a much more inclusive society because the politics are dictating it. Look who's running the United States House of Representatives. Look who just left the White House as president before the current one. Look who's running for president. Look at the largest bank in the world, Jamie Dimon, arguably one of the best bankers ever. And he committed his bank to spending billions of dollars to support advancing African Americans in business and entrepreneurship and home ownership. He has made an effort to transform the bank into hiring more women. The head of consumer banking globally is an African American woman. The head of J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, their uh, consumer and banking division of the of the Northeast, is also an African American woman. Larry, these business people are doing this like Larry Fink and promoting diversity, not because they're philanthropic. And I think that's what everybody needs to understand. This is not a philanthropic, inclusiveness and fairness is not philanthropic. It's fair and it's good for business. And so I think we can leave our audience with the idea that the future is diversity, the future is inclusiveness, and that inclusiveness provides great opportunities. And women who are out here in the world, minorities who are out here in the world, um, people in the gay and transgender community who are out here competing, don't expect it to be fair. Don't expect it to be easy, especially when you're in the entrepreneurial world. But it can be full of opportunities. So let's give our panel a round of applause. Thank you all. Great job. Nice having you. Thank you.